This program is brought to you by Building Basics, where it's our mission to provide valuable education and resources to the design community. An optional quiz to earn AIA credits and a CEU certificate is available. Link will be provided at the end of the video. Today's program is an AIA continuing education program offered to you through Building Basics, a subsidiary of Building Multifamily Inc., a registered AIA provider. With an AIA approved presentation, it is important to have uh, learning objectives. Uh, so with this presentation on understanding tables 601 and 62 of the IBC, uh, the critical considerations are going to be first to evaluate the impact of use occupancy and building types on fire rate assemblies, discuss differences in table 601 of 602 of the IBC. We will also look at the footnotes um, and how they impact our fire rate assembly requirements in both table 601 and 602. We'll also look at how party walls and firewalls complement table 601 and 602 of the IBC. <clears throat> So first of all, let's talk about the purpose of tables 601 and 602. Primary purpose is to determine the number of hours a wall, roof, or ceiling will need to last during an ASTM E119 test. And for reference, table 601 deals primarily with the fire ratings on the interior of the building, whereas table 602 is going to deal with fire ratings on the outside of the building. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about table 602 and, and what we mean here. So this is just one uh, image showing you that the distance between two buildings is going to impact the fire rating required on the outside of the structure. If we're sufficiently far away from another building, then no fire rating will be required. But as we get progressively closer, that rating will increase. Now, before we jump into Table 602, I did want to mention building types briefly, uh, since that's going to be a critical part of the discussion. Uh, there are five different building types in the building code. Types 1 and 2 are considered non-combustible construction. Type 3 uh, has non-combustible exterior walls or fire retardant treated exterior walls with some additional fire rating requirements. Type 4 is heavy timber, uh, which is just large, thicker wood members which have additional fire endurance. Or type 5, which is combustible construction. And as you can see in here, those are both going to be critical factors in table 601 and 602 of the IBC. Looking at table 602, this will focus on the exterior of the wall. Some key considerations are the separation from adjacent structures, or if we have buildings that are across the street from each other, the center line of the roadway is key. Building types and occupancy group must also be considered. And based on this, our fire ratings can vary anywhere from zero to three hours. So in looking at table 602, the first column is the fire separation distance, which is broken into four categories. Less than five feet, five to 10, 10 to 30, and greater than or equal to 30 feet. And then the second column will focus on construction types. So looking at this, if we're less than five feet, construction type is not uh, impacting the fire rating requirement. In a similar fashion, if we're greater than or equal to 30 feet, it's not gonna impact fire rating requirements. However, it does between five and 30 feet. So as an example, in the 10 to 30 feet range, for 1A and 1B construction, the fire rating requirements are going to be slightly higher than a 2B or 5B. And then for all other categories, it will fall into the others section. Let's take a look at an example now. Assume we have a 3B building with an R2 occupancy, which would be residential, and some shared lot as shown in the photo below. In this scenario, if the building is five feet away from the imaginary lot line as shown in the photo then we would be in the less than five feet category and the requirements would be one hour for an r2 occupancy if we were at five to ten feet for a 3b occupancy it would fall in the others category and it'd be a one hour requirement if we were 10 to 30 feet under a 3b category it would be zero hours fire rating requirement on the outside and then at greater than or equal to 30 feet, it would also be zero hours. Let's spend a few minutes talking about the footnotes in the different tables. So in table 602, the first note, footnote we want to take a look at is footnote A, which states that load bearing exterior walls shall also comply with the fire rating resistance requirements of table 601. So that'll be one of the key things 
that we look at here for load bearing exterior walls that even if you don't need a fire resistant rating on the outside of the wall you're still uh, going to have to follow the guidelines in table 601. The next footnote we're going to take a look at is footnote B of table 602 and that really applies to the fire separation distance of less than five feet so in this situation, we're also going to have to take into consideration the fire resistance requirements for party walls. So to start with, uh, before digging into footnote B in a little more detail and its impact, uh, let's first of all discuss what is a party wall. Uh, essentially, this is a wall that is a shared wall between two di different buildings. So the classic example of this would be a townhome have a party wall shared between two and when we have this situation occur per section 706.1.1 they shall be treated as firewalls so what's this typically going to mean uh, often it means that we're going to increase the fire rating requirement of those walls so as an example at an r2 occupancy um, in table 706.4 the fire rating is going to go from one hour to two or three hours. And as you can see in the tabulated value, it's three hours. But if we read in the footnotes of this table, it's gonna drop down to two hours in type two or type five construction. In addition to the footnotes we discussed, there are additional footnotes in uh, C through I for table 602. We're not gonna discuss, but please make sure to reference those before finalizing your design. In particular, if you have any um, storage, high, high hazard occupancy, or even a group U occupancy. So with that being said, let's move over to table 601, which is going to be focused on the inside of our exterior walls and also interior walls of the building. Um, some things to take into account when looking at this. So first of all, what's our building type? Uh, is it a bearing or non-bearing wall? And is it a protected or not protected assembly? So as you can see here, this is the section that's going to cover bearing walls. They can be exterior or interior. And if we go across uh, this row, you'll see that for the most part, the requirements are the same, whether it's exterior or interior, with the one exception um, really jumping out at us is this type 3A construction, where if it's an exterior wall, it's still going to need to maintain two hours, um, whether it's a 3A or 3B. Whereas on the interior, it's going to be a one hour or a zero hour rated wall. Uh, also, if we're looking at an interior wall of a type four construction, uh, which is heavy timber, uh, it does drop down to a one hour or a heavy timber type wall. And you can see in here the different building types across the row here, types one, two, three, four, five, as we discussed before. And there's also protected or unprotected construction. So let's dig into a little bit of these in uh, more detail. So first of all, what makes a wall bearing or non-bearing? So the easiest place to go to is the definition section. So if we look in the IBC, a load-bearing wall is any metal or wood stud wall that supports more than 100 pounds per lineal foot in addition to its own weight. Um, or a masonry or concrete wall that supports more than 200 pounds per lineal foot uh, in addition to its own weight. And so in this situation, um, this will be a consideration for ourselves. Now let's talk about protected versus non-protected, which can be a difficult uh, area of the building code to find more detailed information on. Uh, but essentially, A equals protected and B equals non-protected. So what makes a wall unprotected? Well, let's take this example. Let's say we had a wood-framed wall or a steel wall. And let's say there was no gypsum protecting the frame. That would be considered unprotected. Now let's say we put gypsum on the wall. Now if we were to put a half-inch Type-X gypsum on it, it's typically not going to be enough to give us one hour of fire resistance. That's going to, those studs are going to be good for about 20 minutes of fire endurance, whereas the half inch type X is good for 25 minutes. So we add those two together to less than an hour. That's still going to, going to be considered unprotected construction. 
Uh, now if we were to put 5 eighths type x gypsum on that wall, our studs are good for 20 minutes. The 5 eighths type x gypsum is good for 40 minutes. That would give us one hour. Quite often we're going to be considering that to be protected construction. Now let's take a look at some of the footnotes in table 601. First one we're going to take a look at is footnote A, and which is primarily going to be looking at type 1 construction, whether it's protected or unprotected. And you can see in here that the footnote A will show up uh, under primary structural frame. It's also showing up under bearing walls interior. And what footnote A is going to allow us to do, it's going to allow us to reduce that fire rating requirement by one hour when it's supporting a roof load only. So you may be asking, well, why is this so significant? Well, given, uh, depending on the, the statistics that you look at, um, Typically, over 80% of all the commercial buildings built in the U.S. are one story only, which means they're only supporting a roof. So definitely a critical consideration. We're doing type one construction and a one story building supporting a roof only. Footnote B is also gonna give us guidance that if the roof structure is 20 feet or more above the floor below, there is an opportunity to eliminate the uh, fire protection requirements uh, for those members. Looking at footnote C, what we'll also see is that this footnote is related to roof construction and it is going to allow a heavy timber roof system to be used in lieu of a, in, used in lieu of a one hour rated roof construction with the rationale being that a heavy timber constructed roof. It has thick solid wood members, which are gonna have some inherent fire endurance, which will be very similar to the one hour fire endurance uh, offered by a typical one hour rated assembly. And lastly, looking at footnotes D through F, those footnotes essentially look at the primary structural frame, bearing walls and non-bearing walls, and just make sure that we look at other sections of the code, including section 602 and section 704.1. So to recap, in today's presentation, we talked about the impact of use occupancy and building types on fire rated assemblies. So for example, uh, things like high hazard and storage occupancies could impact the fire rating required on a building. In addition, the building types are gonna have an impact also uh, as they go from types one to type five. We also talked about protected and unprotected uh, within those building types. We then dug into the differences in table 601 and 602 of the IBC with table 601 primarily uh, affecting the interior of the building, including the interior face of exterior walls, whereas table 602 was primarily focused on the exterior side of the exterior walls. We then took a deeper dive into the impact of table footnotes on fire rate assembly requirements. In table 602, we saw that there's some uh, enhance considerations when we have party wall or firewall considerations uh, when we're five feet or less. And then in table 601, uh, we talked about how the structural frame and the roof system may potentially have a different fire rating requirement depending on different considerations. And within all that, as we mentioned, uh, we did discuss how party walls and firewalls complement table 601 and 602 of the IBC. And lastly, just as a note, while table 601 and 602 are critical to establishing fire rating requirements, there are provisions within the code that may change what's in those tables. With that said, uh, thank you so much for reviewing the Building Basics course on table 601 and 602. This program does qualify for a, a quarter uh, AIA uh, HSW credit. Um, if you'd like to get that credit, go to buildingbasics.org slash CEU and take the quiz uh, for simple questions to qualify. And if you have any further questions, feel free to, add, um, to email us at admin at buildingbasics.org. Thank you so much.